What are case control studies? And what can we learn about nutrition from them? Let's science it. Hey, welcome to Nourishable. I'm Dr. Lara. A case control study is a type of observational design in which researchers recruit a group of people who have an outcome, aka the cases, and a group of people who don't have the outcome, aka the controls, and then look at their past exposures to gain insight about risk factors. For example, if we're interested in studying nutrition and type 2 diabetes, then volunteers with type 2 diabetes would be our cases, and volunteers without diabetes would be our controls. Then the researchers would ask both groups about their exposures and take some other measurements like body weight and blood tests to see if there are differences. Since we're all budding nutrition scientists, the exposures that we're usually interested in are food-related, like consumption of sugary drinks. The idea here is that the researchers are looking backwards to see if there are any differences in diet between the cases and the controls in the past that may have been hypothetically contributing to the development of the disease. This study, published by a team of researchers from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, used a case control design to study the relationship between type 2 diabetes and sugary drinks. They recruited just over a thousand people who were recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in Sweden, and a similar number of non-diabetic adults from the same Swedish regions. To measure their exposures, all participants were given a giant survey where they were asked to fill out how frequently and what serving sizes of various foods and beverages they ate over the past year. These are called food frequency questionnaires, and they're a really common tool in observational nutrition studies. In the year before your diagnosis, how often did you drink pop? This is called a retrospective analysis because the researchers are looking backwards at exposures. When they ran the statistics, the researchers found that people who reported drinking two or more servings of sugary drinks per day had a threefold higher likelihood of having type 2 diabetes compared to people who reported drinking none. They also found that every additional serving of sugary drinks was associated with a 20% higher chance of having diabetes. These sound like pretty convincing results. Can we say that sugary drinks cause type 2 diabetes? Mm, no. First off, since the researchers recruited a group of people who already had diabetes and a group who didn't, we don't know how many people would go on to develop type 2 diabetes in the absence of sugary drinks. Also, this is an observational study, so the researchers didn't control whether or not people drank sugary drinks. Instead, the participants themselves reported how much and how frequently they consumed sugary drinks. And this means that there could be some problems in our exposure measurement, because people may not remember clearly, or maybe they're embarrassed so they lie. Or maybe it's hard to estimate because visualizing 200 milliliter size servings is really tough. The other thing that may introduce bias is that the researchers were specifically asking the cases to report their dietary intake the year before their diagnosis. Was there something I did that caused my disease? I have cola at the movies, a Mountain Dew at lunch, and a cream soda nightcap. Yikes. Maybe all my hydration came from soda pop. If you were just diagnosed with a disease, you might be wondering whether there was anything that you did that caused you to develop the disease, and that may impact your reporting. This is called recall bias, and it can make the diet assessment unreliable. A challenge in many observational studies like these case controls is that there could be many other exposures that contributed to the type 2 diabetes besides sugary drinks. These are called confounders. In this study, the researchers also asked participants about other information, like their age, sex, education, smoking status, physical activity, and other diet habits like fruit and vegetable intake. The reality is that most chronic diseases, like type 2 diabetes, can develop due to a confluence of lifestyle factors. Then they ran their statistics again and included all this additional information to statistically correct for their contribution and help isolate the relationship between sugary drinks and type 2 diabetes. Typically, the most relevant results to talk about are the ones that include all the confounders in the statistical model. 
so all the results that I reported were from the fully corrected model. However, sometimes the nutrition media will generate headlines from the results that weren't correcting for all the confounders. And then these headlines get manipulated into misinformation. Watch out for this as a critical news consumer. If you can, try to read the original study or at least the abstract to see if those results match up with what the nutrition media is reporting. So if case control studies can't tell us about causation, what are they good for? Case control studies are generally faster and less expensive to do than other studies that follow participants for a long time to see if they develop a disease. Plus, they can be really powerful when a particular disease of interest is quite rare. In this particular study, they also recruited a third group of people with a subtype of diabetes called Late Onset Autoimmune Diabetes in Adults, or LADA. Another time when case control studies can be useful is when the exposure you're studying is an innate characteristic of a person, like genetics. Unlike diet, which people can be unreliable at reporting, a person's genes are the same for their whole life. So a case control study where the researchers are investigating whether a particular gene variant is more common in the cases versus the controls can be an insightful study design. Overall, case control studies allow us to look backwards to estimate whether past exposures are different between people who have certain diseases versus people that don't have that disease. They're still on the lower end of our hierarchy of evidence. Remember that case control studies can tell us when there's an association between a dietary factor and having a disease, but they can't tell us if a dietary factor causes the disease. Watch out for causational language when you're a nutrition news consumer, and train your spidey science sense to tingle if you see case control and cause in the same sentence. That's what science tastes like. Thanks for tuning in to Nourishable. Check out my link to the study I talked about today in the video description if you want to read it in more depth. Plus, check out my whole video series on the hierarchy of evidence. And if you value this content, help support the channel by sponsoring Nourishable on Patreon. We'd be oh so grateful for that cup of coffee while reading studies on PubMed. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.